touch on the fact that um, I mean, we're around the same age, grew up pretty close in uh, as far as proximity to yeah our suburbs mm. and that sort of shit. Yeah, you said that your parents uh were second gen more or less. Yeah, you know, mine were first, but they yeah. got you young. Yeah. Right? What do you think? I mean, you compare, say, we, I mean, we can disagree, we can agree on a lot of shit. Yeah. And we have aligning interests and common themes in our discussions, but there's a massive contrast to, say, all the fucking meatheads that we sort of grew up with. Well, that toxic masculinity that does exist, say, within the Greek uh, community in yeah. Melbourne. Yeah. Where do you reckon that comes from? I mean, what are the driving factors? Would you just say parents and relatives and immediate focus groups around them? Yeah, yes, because, you know, we're not born with masculinities. You know, masculinity, as we know, is a is a construct. Yeah. It's learnt, it's behaviour. And you have to learn that from somewhere. I know I got my my sort of... Say anything in that sort of... Con- in yeah. In that uh, respect. I mean, I watched my old man growing up, and he was your man's man. But yeah. at the same time, you know, he had some form of tenderness as well. Sure. Right? Yeah. I mean, everything I learned regarding hard work and, you know, integrity and all that sort of shit, it was from him Yeah, growing up. But I'm just trying to think, like, that fine line, you know, where it just goes over the over the edge. Yeah. How the fuck did we end up this way? It could be a case of the father. You think so? It could be because, you know, my father as well, you know, quite, quite a man's man in many ways, but a very gentle um, tender man and also a very hands-on father. This is... A, Another thing that we've got to remember, a lot of men of our um, parents' generation, the men were not hands-on fathers in many cases. Oh, no. Nah. They thought it was women's work, yeah. which is a disgrace because, you know, you created this being as well. Where's your input? Uh, and a lot of m- men that, you know, I knew would brag about the fact that they, and I know this is, sounds hard to believe, but they bragged about the fact that they weren't hands-on fathers. They thought it was... Wonderful. Yeah. And is it, it's uh, women's work. You leave it to the women. Well, you mark my words, these men regret <laughs> that now because they've got their hands in their heads wondering why they either don't have relationships with their children, yeah. very strange relationships, or very conflicting relationships with their children because yeah. they weren't there. In any way, and yes, yes, we know but back in the day, you know, women did stay at home more, men worked more, but that's still no excuse. That you are working a lot, you know, you should make time for your children. There's always time if you want to make the time. I think that's one of the saddest things when a parent doesn't actually know their child. Yeah, can't can't name three of his friends. You know, can't name a hobby. Can't yeah. name a, a trait. Why'd you have one? Why'd you have the children? Yeah. Uh, it seems I hate to me that. pointless. I mean, you know, and there's a lot to say about people that shouldn't have children because they don't really want them. I think a lot of them like the idea of them but don't actually like the work that goes into them. And I think men quite often are portrait painters uh, in the sense that they like to have that that pretty picture that they can present to the world of the woman, of the children, of the house. But particularly when it comes to the children or sometimes even the relationship, they're not interested in the the work, the back-end work that's needed. And it's a big responsibility being a father. Again, I think it's Mm. just you, you tie it back in with ego. Of course, it goes back to ego. Uh, you were talking about that fine line. We can talk about, let's just talk about toxic masculinity, toxic femininity. Yeah. There's nothing inherently toxic about being a man or being a woman. We, we spoke about the natural biological templates of, yeah. of man, woman, manhood, womanhood. There's nothing toxic about that. And sometimes I think people, in the case of you know the, all this talk about toxic masculinity, people feel... Uh, um, that they're under attack, they're under a siege just by being men. Yep. Uh, and maybe that's the way some of these people that run on this toxic masculinity train, that's the way that they communicate or that's, that's what they imply. There are problems within social constructs of femininity and, and, and masculinity. There's great stuff there too, but I think we, can, we could make a list of the attributes that are problematic. We don't even have to say toxic if you don't want to use that word. You can talk about problematic, and you can say, okay, these attributes are more so attributed to men. Violence, aggression, um, you know, emotional sterility, you know, things like this, um, stoicness. You 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 could add that to the list. Uh, These are things that are more so attributed to men. Yeah. I don't want to say that women can't undertake them, but more so attributed to men. You know, sexual violence as well. I mean, that's a big one. Yeah. That's a big problem we've had since the dawn of time. 
Yeah, that, and then you can get up the list of, of the of the the female side of it, and you can talk about you know bitchiness, you can talk about cattiness, you can talk about passive aggression, you can talk about emotional manipulation, you can talk about you know phantom pregnancies, you know you can talk about all those things. Yeah, and say okay, these are the the attributes that are more so attributed to women yeah. that we can call that you know problematic femininity so i've no issue with that and i've talked about that as well you know what i love that one quote well, who's that feminist that mo- uh, the feminist you love oh there's there's two i love yeah. there's camille paglia maybe that's what i'm thinking and of. jermaine greer no not jermaine greer it was camille camille and she said that line about men dying in um more men have died in the defense of women throughout the history of time yeah for any than any other yeah. cause that have broken their backs yeah. and um you know their bloods have been blood drained out of yeah. their systems virtually to house, house their and women protect, and children yeah. house, house and protect, protect yeah women and, and yet children modern feminism doesn't give them credit for that yeah and is intent on, and i think that's true in that i know to, to make a distinction between the modes of feminism that modern day feminism doesn't so i think that's true that it doesn't give men the credit that they that they deserve. Yeah. Where I think, you know, Paglia is very much about, I think a lot of men like Paglia and a lot of men like Jermaine Greer and a lot of men like um, Christine Hoff Sommers. And these are the, and women too, of course, but they're what you call equity feminists where you have, you know, people like Clementine Ford and, you know, many others that are the, the gender feminists. Yeah. So um, people ask me all the time, are you a feminist? And my answer is yes. And then people get a bit old because they don't know what type of feminist you are and you they think that you're of the modern ilk yeah. of, of, of feminism, and which I'm certainly not. But I explain my feminism, and it's very, very similar to Greer's and, and Puglia's. Uh, I believe in equal legal rights and statuses for men and women, uh, but beyond that we can't be equal because we're so different. Yeah. But as long as that's equal... I'm happy. I believe in fairness of outcome, you know, equity, um, and equal opportunity. Now, these things don't always happen, no. but we should strive for them, and I believe in them. You have to realize as well that people that make decisions in social structures can and will discriminate, and we can't expect a complete eradication of this kind of discrimination because that kind of discrimination lives in the hearts and minds of individuals. So systemic discrimination will always occur, but the idea of it is important. The idea of, you know, fairness of outcome and equal treatment, this yeah. is important. I don't believe in equal outcome, though. This idea that if you're running a corporation, you've got your marketing department and your finance and et cetera, research and development, that you must have a 50-50, yeah, 50% yeah, yeah, yeah. meant no, because th- I believe in a more merit-based system, a fairness of bringing people's skills and talents to the fore and judging them based on that. If you're setting quotas, any kinds of quotas, gender quotas, etc., then you have that at the forefront of your mind. Gender gender, uh, gender discrimination in a workplace is bullshit, mm. right? Because, I mean, especially, I mean, I'm, I've been a victim of it as well. I mean, certain, certain industries are aligned a certain way mm. just by the force of nature, just by literally... There are men dominating certain industries, not because yeah. it was some sort of gender block out. No. It wasn't. That was just how it happened. Well, you know, the construction industry yeah. is very male-dominated. Certain departments and certain corporations are very male-dominated, where others are more female. You know, if you look across the board in corporations, generally marketing and HR is more female-dominated. Yeah. And I'm fine oh. with... With all whatever. the recruiters, all the recruiters. Yeah. I've been, I've sat down with how many recruit, uh, recruiters and recruitment agents over the last month. Yeah. One was male. Male. The rest were women. Exactly. Now, I'm happy with that. I don't care if uh, a certain department organization is more female or more male. I'm assuming that they've done that based on merit. Yeah. And that's what it should be. If an industry is gender dominated. Yeah. And, the, and there's cause for reform because it's gender do- nominated because of discrimination. I know STEM is a big one. We had Dr. Uh, Thompson here a couple of weeks ago yeah. and she talked at length about it, right? The fact that women in STEM fight things like the toxic masculinity. It, it exists because you're thinking of old world mentalities, got old farts in white coats yeah. running that industry. Yeah. You know, so it's going to exist to some degree. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not disputing that. What I don't like is the gender-based discrimination because they feel that an industry is imbalanced because of discrimination, 
when it's not. Not. Yeah, and that's what we talk about. We talk about a merit system. Yeah. We talk about um, equal opportunity and fairness of outcome. That's all we should strive for. And thirdly, my brand of feminism is about uh, freedom and choice. Yeah. The, the choice for women to be housewives, if they want to be, because that's what the original movement was about, was about choice and freedom. Yeah. That you should do as you please. To have the career, have both. And the freedom, you know, the, the freedom of body autonomy, autonomy um, abortion rights, uh, sexual freedoms and liberties. Uh, These are the things uh, I, I agree can't. with. I'm actually still getting angry about that whole thing in the in the states, man. With uh, which one? The them whining about the clock was it in Alabama? No, it was in Alabama. It was in um, Arkansas. Was it Arkansas? The abortion thing? Yes, 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 yes. yes. That, I wasn't happy about that. Is it still in effect? I've got even it, see it. All these things keep popping up, and they just get pushed to the side because all the new shit keeps coming in. Yeah, and you don't know which front to fight. No, you just forget about it. The abortion thing, you, uh, I clash with many people online about abortion. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm pro-abortion. Yeah, so am I. Yeah, I be- and I don't believe, and I know in our state we've had this system where, you know, if a woman wants an abortion, she needs the, the permission of two doctors, <laughs> which I think is ridiculous, uh, provided that it's done within the first trimester when the fetus is not a complete separate entity. Yeah. Um, I'm all for it. And you don't have to give a reason. It's your own business. It's your own body. Yeah. And I believe, you know, abortion is, is such a blessing because why, you know, Socrates said it himself. He said, you know, sometimes it's better to have not been born. And I think that's true. It spares the, the being, the child that is to come. It spares the, the parent or the parents. And it even spares the wider society. So, you know, I, it's interesting, isn't it? All this, um, fanaticism about, um, yeah, it's, it's hardline stances now. Very much. Everyone, it, it just, it's just become this And you thing. know, the evangelical cunts. Oh. Uh, they're, I believe, behind, you know, the majority of this. And Donnie, you know, he... I don't know if Donnie believes half the things he says. He doesn't believe a word of it, man. I don't think His so. whole life, his whole life has been this uh, fornicating <laughs> philanderer living in excess... You know, they the the Republican Party are painting him out to be this meek giver of love and wealth. You yeah. know, like he's wearing a cloak and walking through streets and helping people. What are you nuts? I think he just says and does what he needs to in order to appeal to the ultra nationalists. That's his base. The ultra conservatives, the evangelicals the people that pay his that sign his checks. Yes, they're the, they're the people that he plays up to. So his rhetoric. Is, is aimed at them, is aimed yeah. at pleasing them. And I think that he, Donnie will probably get in again. Oh, he will. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm starting I'm to lean. Certain. It's not necessarily because he's doing all the right things, but I don't think the Democrats have actually pulled anything no. out. No, and the problem is, I mean, look, <coughs> we had that choice. I'm not sorry, not we. They had they that, yeah. excuse me. They had that choice between Donnie and, and Hillary. I mean, what a horrible, horrible choice. If, if I was an American citizen, I would have voted for neither. Um, I believe she's worse than him. And it's funny because people say uh, she's the lesser of two evils. Now, if you're going to talk about that key word, evil, then her history up to this point is far more evil and corrupt, in my opinion. Well, and I think any... I mean, if you run through the list, and I'll give you a quick summary. I mean, if you have to go back to the um, the Balkan Wars, where... Um, her pathological lying is on record, and, you know, Hitch, of course, covered this because he, he absolutely hated the Clintons. I would have loved to have heard what he had to say about Donny as president, but he didn't like the Clintons. I mean, she lied about g- coming under the, the line of fire I- in the name of national duty yeah, when it was that. proven that yeah. it didn't happen. She also prevented the end of the Balkan War, um, convincing Bill not to end it at a, at, at a certain point where they had an opportunity because she felt that it would get in the way of her marvellous health care bill. It would take away the attention from her health care bill, which we knew was an absolute disaster. You want, you know what the problem is, is the fact that Hillary was a career politician. She was a career politician. She got into po- she got into school to get into politics. Yeah, like Bill. So her paper trail is all politically motivated. Yeah. Donnie didn't. No, Donnie He's- is... He lived off his old man's name yeah. and did nothing but shitty investments and fuck around on women. Yeah. <laughs> Until one day decided, hey, 
I can make more money doing this. Doing this, yeah. Yeah, and he doesn't like to lose, which is no. when Obama uh, humiliated him during that uh, speech, remember? The yeah. White House? yeah. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he took that personally. He's like, fuck this. Well, he's not used to, see, he's used to being the big CEO. He's not yeah. used to being questioned and challenged and criticized, exactly. which is why, partly why, I think he's so... I mean, I think it's his medical condition as well, I believe. You know, he's on the scale. <laughs> and he's got per- narcissistic personality disorder on top of it. Yeah. But when he is criticised in that spectre, you know, he does feel like he's under attack and he gets very, very defensive. But on the other hand, because he's got no filter, he says things to people that <laughs> occasionally are correct. And the way that I think sometimes he goes after Hillary Clinton is, is amusing. Some of the things he's said to her, I think, are, are pretty accurate. I mean, I just... Uh, you go. We talk about um, sexual crimes, you know, yeah. and people seem to forget that Bill Clinton has a very colourful history. Oh yeah, and I'm not talking about Lewinsky. No, no, I'm talking more. about prior to yeah, that. I mean, he's ver- yeah, almost certainly a sex criminal and yeah. a rapist. And what has she done? I mean, she stood by him. Not only stood by him, but she's helped to cover up his crimes and she's um, silenced silenced victims. That's another thing that I think takes her off the feminist list uh, and puts her on the corrupt list automatically. Then you have. All that, you know, the Clinton Foundation, highly corrupt. There isn't a a donor that they won't take money from. And the interesting thing as well is that when she was Secretary of State, the biggest um, arms deal was done with, with Saudi and Qatar. And the same money that was being filtered into funding ISIS, that Saudi Qatari money, was also being filtered into the Clinton Foundation. Yeah. And then you have this, uh, this incessant need to find this woman a place in politics simply because she's uh, uh, Bill Clinton's wife. Let's make a Secretary of State. Mind you, she has no foreign policy experience worth mentioning, but let's make a Secretary of State. And then you have what I believe to be the, the worst part of her activities was, you know, what, what has gone on in Yemen. She was, you know, kind of at the forefront of that at the beginning. And then you have the mess in Syria which she was, you know, she was significantly that, involved yeah. in as well with Obama. And then you have the mess in Libya, which I take great um, insult to because uh, she and Obama went in then. It was, you know, and as the, the, the papers prove that she was at the forefront of that. That was her war, pretty much, the yeah. removal of um, Mr. Gaddafi. So, you know, they went in there aiming for, you know, regime and region control. That They've killed him off. With no plan to facilitate a democratic government, he was building, you know, a certain brand of currency, I believe, which he was intending to elevate. Yeah, the, the Pan-Arabic uh, Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they weren't going to have that either. And the other good thing, well, he wasn't a good man, but one thing that I liked about Gaddafi was that he had a so-called wall in place that we know that Libya is the gateway to Europe with yeah. Italy being the closest port. So you had a system in place that was preventing mass spillages of refugees from North Africa into Europe. And because of Hillary's callous and careless plan, went in there, guns blazing, had him killed. Now Libya is a cesspool of modern-day slavery and human trafficking support. They didn't think of the poor Libyans. And Gaddafi gone. Now that program he had in place, preventing that the mass spillage of refugees in North Africa is gone. So then Europe suffers all these unnecessary refugees, people that they can't handle, that they don't want or need. So not only are the Libyan people suffering, you have Europe suffering because of this, and there is footage of her sitting back and laughing. I don't know if you've seen it on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, remember that. You said yeah, to yeah. We came, we saw he, he died, died, and she's and she thinks it's funny. Yeah. Now tell. Now I've given you a rundown of Hillary's crimes and misdemeanors, and there's also the emails. Yeah. On on top of everything else, and people say, oh, but her emails, as if to say, well, this is the only thing that people think that they've got on her. Well, we've given you a, we've given the listeners a long list. Yeah of things that she's been involved in that are extremely shady. You know, the thing that annoys me, though, I mean... So Donnie hasn't done what she's done. Donnie's, Donnie's done his own shit. <laughs> like, yes, but know, it's not the equivalent it's to not what the, she's It's done. not on a world scale, it's on a national scale. And it's on a personal level, not on, on Hillary's uh, warmongering sort of level. Yeah. Because Hillary got a taste of... Hillary got a taste of what world politics is and what world power is yeah donnie doesn't actually understand the power that he has as the leader of the free world yeah in his head he's just 
this business mogul with a lot of money that yeah. everyone wants to be. He doesn't actually understand that he's a world, le- he's a diplomat. And he's maybe that's good in some ways as well. It's good and it's bad. This is what bothers me. Whether or not Hillary was like a warmonger and a, a maniac. Well, she was, yeah. Right? She like, is. Like, you get that, yeah? Yeah. And who does she, and, and you know, as Secretary of St- uh, State and blah, 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 and she was like an advisor and all that sort of shit. Like, you get that. That's their, that's their front. You look at Donnie's fucking administration. Who's, who are his advisors? He's, he's got his daughter and his son-in-law in there. Yeah. As advisors. As advisors, One's yeah. a, a failed real estate module, like, yeah. you know, just a mini version of Donald. Yeah, and then you got Ivanka. It's the hopeless. Yeah. Hopeless. These people are advising, advising an Aspie, yeah. <laughs> like, narcissistic <laughs> president. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It yeah. It makes no sense. But the other interesting thing about Donnie is that he doesn't really show any interest in uh, Middle Eastern interferences. Which he I just counts money. Uh, yeah. And uh, he's he actually wanted to pull out of Syria. I think he pulled out of it to a certain degree. Yeah. I don't know if whether it was the full degree or not. I don't think it was. But, I mean, I think they pulled out to a significant degree. They haven't pulled out of Yemen. Well, they won't, will they? Because no, this is no. Saudi's war with yeah. Iran, using Yemen as a, as a proxy ground. So they're not going to give up the support of the but Saudis. That's the thing. You understand. Mm. You understand the reason. You understand the policy. You understand the playing field. You understand all that, right? You're just a guy in Melbourne you know, who looks at this as a, as a form of interest. Yeah. The president of the United States, the leader of the free world, does not understand any of this. No, I don't think he wants to. No, he doesn't. He doesn't no. care for it. <laughs> That's the whole he's point. He's just happy that he's in that chair. He's just happy that he he's won. He's in the Oval Office. He won. He in won. In his eyes, he won. He won. And that's the problem. Yeah. And, and that's what shits me. His rhetoric now is just about, it's still about Hillary. He's still talking about Hillary and how he beat her and blah, 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 and she's evil uh, and the emails. It, d- dude, mm. um, watch anything he said in, in El Paso. Watch anything he said in Dayton. Well, you see on Twitter too. Yeah. Yeah. He's still going off about it. He's got re-elections coming up, and instead of talking about policy, anytime he gets uh, in front of a camera and and the media asks him specifically about policy, he has nothing to say. And you know what's interesting about that is I think that, and I might have said this to you before, Donnie doesn't have the bank account of the average person, but he certainly has the dialogue yeah. of the average person. He speaks the dialogue and echoes the ideas of the labourer, yeah. the farmer, the gas station attendant, Even the retail worker. Even though his policies are fucking all of those people. Regardless, <laughs> you know, you could say that too, but, you know, there are things in, in his rhetoric. Yeah. Rhetoric is different from policy. Yeah. Not always the same thing. So he says things and does things that appeal to them. One thing that he was able to do that a, a Obama, the golden boy, could never do, and, um, you know, Clinton, the Bushes, etc., um, they couldn't reach that m- middle majority. Yeah. And he was able to do that, and I think his Twitter account was a great aid because he's forever tweeting. I, he's millions yeah, of tweets. Yeah, and cunts have got a phone in hand. They're getting statements from Donnie every day, so they feel like Donnie's talking to me. Donnie's, yeah. um, and also he campaigned in all the correct areas. He reached, he built that bridge between middle America and the presidency. Well, Clinton was too busy, you know, on stage prancing about with Beyonce and Jay-Z and being very elitist uh, and ignoring the majority. Yeah. She didn't have time for the majority. Well, she certainly paid for that. And she'll blame everyone else but herself, you know, for her failures. Now, the problem with the Democratic Party, with the exception of maybe um, Sanders, who I have heard him talk about policy... Yeah, he d- at length. At he length. was on uh, Rogan's podcast the other day. Yeah. He did well. And I think he has a lot of great policies, I mean, and particularly the healthcare stuff It's so important, and education. This is what it's important to me. We have to do the core policies. Wherever you are in the world, it's healthcare, it's education, it's econ- economy, it's employment, it's infrastructure, it's I environment. Think, um, I think the biggest challenge that the Democrats have, because they're all sort of riding on Bernie's form of... of um, they're trying to. Yeah. Like that- well, they've seen how well it did for him. Yeah. And so they're all trying to ride on that wave and sort of make their own versions of this n- nouveau socialism. Yeah. Whatever you want to call it, right? I think the biggest hurdle they're going to have is trying to convince the red states or the Republican voter, trying to convince them that Medicare does not equal socialism. And, you know? and in their minds, uh, what is the first cousin to socialism? 
Yeah. It's communism. Yeah. So they're scared of communism. That's the thing. Mm. Donnie's rhetoric is so strong that mm. he can just fire off these spurious uh, tweets and still keep his base as long as he's got this fear element to it. The, and most Americans want health care. Yeah, they well, want. You have to be insane not to. Yeah, they want health care. They want education. They want all the shit that, yeah. you know, quote unquote socialism brings. But the problem is, is like you said, first cousin of socialism is communism. That's what they so think. His yeah. rhetoric just yeah. keeps firing out this Venezuelan, Cuban, Russian sort of yeah. shit at him. Or China. It, China. He doesn't go after Russia. He goes after China. Yeah. You know, because he, he knows better than to piss fucking uh, Putin off. Putin, yeah. And that's the funniest thing. I'll never forget. Was it the G20 summit? The first time they met, he yeah. just shrank. He shrank to the... Like, it, Trump is a big man. Mm. But he looked an inch shorter than Putin, Putin up on that stage, man. Well, of course. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's Putin, isn't it? He, yeah. the, the dynamics and the vibe and atmosphere of Putin. Could you imagine when Tony Abbott wanted to shirt front him? Could you imagine? Get fucked. Get fucked, exactly. <laughs> He would have eaten him as a canopy, yeah. not even Putin as an entree. A, he was a, ca- a KGB operative. Man. Yeah, his whole fucking existence was espionage and killing. Yeah, yeah. Seriously, you can't, and you, you have that turned into a, a, a senator turned into a fucking world leader. You can't. Yeah, you can't that. No, you can't do it. No, nah. no. So yeah, look, and I think the other problem with the Democrats is that they're focused on Donny. Yeah. The majority of them. They're all about Donnie. Yeah. Maybe they should leave Donnie alone and focus on policy. Buttigieg uh, said that. Mate, yeah. Pete, he said we need to stop focusing on Donnie and start talking about... And the other thing they need to stop focusing on is this bloody identity politics, this feverish yeah. fanaticism of identity and pushing identity to the fore and creating these rigid prisms of villainy and victimhood and pigeonholing people yeah. according to their identities, villainy, victimhood. You know, it's it's silly. Who do you reckon? Who do you reckon is going to get the Democratic nomination? Oh well, I thought Biden might be a safe. I thought Biden was a safe bet, but he's slipping hard. He has. I mean, yes, he did terribly in all the um the debates. Yeah, and everything he says, he just something he fucks up something, he just makes himself look. Initially, I thought he yeah. would be. That that was just the nostalgia, though. Yeah, it wasn't anything else. I don't know anything about Biden's politics. They're not very progressive. Well, they need to put someone forward that's a balance. Who do you reckon's going to do it? Well, I don't know. I, I, I'm i not really... I mean, I like a lot of what Sanders says, but is he going to be the candidate? I like what Sanders says. He's he's on the level. Yeah. But they'll just play the old card, and he's, he's out of old. his mind. Yeah. They'll play the... He's out of his mind. He's an old communist. He's got no idea. Yeah. That's that, 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 And if that's the card they play, they'll win. Yeah. The, the, the Republicans will win if Bernie's up there. They'll just play the old card, and that'll be that. Well, maybe, you know, in the previous... If they had put Sanders at the forefront oh, instead of um, yeah. Hillary, yeah. then I think they would have had a... Four years ago, yeah. Yeah, four years ago. Now... Now, yes, you're right. I'm not completely sure. They'd have to come up with someone pretty special. Who? Well, this is the thing. <laughs> I've, I've watched those debates, and there's nothing special. No one stands out. No. And they've got dirt on nearly every single candidate. They'll, they'll find something, whether it's inexperience or just, you know, hip, hypocritical politics or policy or whatever. Yeah. There's no one that's just like a, yeah, like, like you said, four years ago, Bernie for sure would have, yeah. if it was Bernie instead of Hillary, Bernie would have won. Yeah. And I think that you have to convert all those people that are, you know, behind Trump. Yeah. And how do you do that? You know, they haven't learnt their lesson. They haven't tried to reach these people, not really reach them and talk to them. The, the problem is, is that all of Trump's policies over the last uh, couple of years, they've screwed the people that he said he was speaking to, he said he was going to remember. You know, the coal miners and the farmers yeah. and all that shit. All these tax breaks and tariffs, that fucked all those industries. And the other thing as well that he talks about... But his rhetoric is that strong. That's what I'm talking about. The rhetoric yeah. is appealing um, to these to these sectors. I mean, he talked about you know a return to local manufacturing, uh, and this is something that you hear. You know, Pauline Hanson has, yeah, has talked yeah. about it as well here. Uh, look, it is a nice idea, but it's not going to happen. No, you can't reverse that g- globalized clock. Now, as I say to people, you know, you pay you know two dollars for this. Yeah. 
um, you know, bottle of water or, you know, ceramic mug, or let's say ceramic mug. Ceramic mug, you're paying $2 at Kmart for it or Big W. Are you really willing to pay four fifty, five dollars $5 for it when you've been paying, you know, My wages haven't gone up in seven years. Right. So uh, this is what's going to happen if you return to local manufacturing, is you're going to be paying double. Yeah. You know, if not more. Starting in the name of double, yeah. Correct. In the name of, you know, local manufacturing. As we said, I think it's a nice idea, but nice ideas don't always translate to uh, realistic, you know, outcomes. Yeah. And it wouldn't be a realistic outcome. It, it, it can't happen. But it does appeal to those people that have that nostalgia and that are against the ideals of globalization. And of course, globalization has its problems. What do you reckon is going to happen here? I've, we've sense? spent like an hour talking about American politics, but we haven't. It's so about interesting, isn't it? Well, I, I have to, to be honest. I find Australian politics to be so uninteresting. It is. Why? You know, I'm, I, I struggle with the same thing because I just maybe it's because we don't have characters. I feel yeah, yeah we don't connect. We don't have characters. We don't connect to them. Uh, we've had a succession of you know. Uh, you know, post Howard, who was the last real stable, you know, prime minister. Yeah, leadership had. spills and yeah, we've you know you've had, you've had you know um, Rudd, you know Abbott, Gillard, Rudd, <laughs> yeah, Rudd, um, Rudd again, Rudd, yeah, uh, Turnbull, um, and now we have Morrison. Um, but you know, you we haven't really elected the majority of them. There's been all this infighting. As Wait, who said. did we elect? Morrison got elected. Morrison, that's it. Morrison got elected. He did. We elected him. Did Turnbull get elected? No, he took it from Abbott. Yeah. uh, uh, Turnbull, Abbott, Rudd, Gillard. Uh, (laughs) There's been, you know, changes because of their own egos. It's all about that that tedious. And it is. It's such a tedious infight that we we resent them because we haven't elected them. We haven't had a say and we're supposed to have a say. And we don't like these... Um, government changes. Yeah. Uh, so I think we become quite disillu- disillusioned by it. And uh, the other thing as well is I don't think that we've, as I said, we don't have characters in politics, and I think characters like Donnie are interesting. Yeah. Uh, Hillary, even though I, I, look, I don't like either of them, I particularly despise her, but she's still a character. She's interesting. Yeah. Absolutely interesting. And the global stage is so interesting. But the Australian stage is just not, and I have to force myself, and because I, I believe I should be interested, and I should look into it more, and I, I, I feel, do, I feel do like my an best. Idiot. I feel like an idiot because I don't pay as much attention. Like, yeah. I can, like we're talking I about the Democratic candidates. I can, I can name yeah. ten to fifteen Democratic candidates. It's like thirty of them. Yeah, because you're more interested in that. Yeah. Cause it's more interesting. Um, I think but that we, we should take more. We're not even in exposed politics. to it the way we are exposed to the, the American shit. The only yeah. way you can watch Australian politics is if you turn on. You know the the fucking at two o'clock. Uh, what time is it? Uh, what time is Parliament? Parliament two p- two, p- two two o'clock or something. I don't know that. Everyone's at work at two o'clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the only time you get yeah. to watch any of this shit. Yeah, but we're nowhere near as. Exploring. But we also don't. Well, you and I and many others don't do it. Research it on our own accord as yeah. much. Um, now I push myself to do it which is not a good sign for me, but I still push myself <laughs> to do it because I need to be educated and, yeah. and to know what's happening. But I don't push myself to learn about the global political stage. I naturally kind of gravitate towards yeah. it and I soak it, up, soak it up like a sponge. But we haven't had leaders, at least in our adult lifetimes, that we can look up to, that we can admire, that we can get behind, that we can support. I think um, I love Big Bob. Bob Hawke, he was great. Yeah. Uh, of course, we were very, very young. But you look at his policies. Yeah. I mean, you look at the, the Medicare. You look at his interest in, in environment. He was a scholar. Yeah, I had no idea. He was a scholar. He was into equality. He was very much about pushing equality. Yeah. He was great. Oh, he loved women. <laughs> he loved women. Oh, of course. He loved these women. Man. loved women. Uh, but all about <laughs> equality. He was about workers' rights. He was, yeah. And I, that's one of my passions, too, is workers' rights. It's very important. He was also very good at foreign policy. Yeah. He worked well with Mr. Gorbachev. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he, he worked well with Maggie, Maggie Thatcher too. So I think, yeah, he w- he was great. I wish we had something, someone like him. How old was Hawke when he entered the, the, the race of prime minister? Oh, would it have, I don't know how old he was. Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, isn't after, and then we had Paul Keating that wasn't too bad. 
He was like another weakened version of, of Bob Hawke, basically. He wasn't bad. I mean, I remember seeing him a lot on television and in the papers when I was young. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, I, I was... Yeah, I remember one of my first earliest memories of politics in, in Australia hmm. was the leadership spill of, of Keating taking over. Yeah. I still remember it. I think Bob Hawke, I greatly admire. And I have... There are there are three other... Po- Let me ask you this. There are, <laughs> there are three other modern-day world leaders that... I greatly admire in my top three. Can you guess which ones they are? I can give you Putin. Yeah. Thatcher. Yeah. Modern. I mean, yeah. She, They're modern. Was that modern? She was modern. Yeah. Absolutely. She was late 80s and... Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we, we highlighted why I like Putin. And <laughs> yeah. And with Maggie, she did things that I didn't agree with. The polling tax. What the happened? iron box. <laughs> the iron box. I like the iron box. Yeah. Uh, the coal miners issue, I, I didn't agree with. If you are planning on importing cheap coal and you have these towns whose bread and butter is the coal mining industry you better do something about it if you plan on shutting yeah. down the mines um but again i mean I, she was another one that was extremely bold and transparent i like what she did in regards to the european union that was my favorite thing so i'm quite anti-european union and you know she forewarned everyone about yeah. the dangers uh of the European Union. Why are you anti-European Union? I don't think I've ever asked you that. Okay. Well, <laughs> she she took a stance against the the single currency for all these different economies because yeah. she knew that it wouldn't work. She was also took a stance against the centralized bank um, and against this idea of um, a European body that takes away from the sovereignty and autonomy yeah. of nation states. And this is a few reasons why I'm against the European Union. But I, well, the third, I just want to mention the third politician, then I'll get to the yeah. European Union, is Golda Meir. Oh, yeah. Love Golda. <laughs> Love me some Golda. She was terrific. And what a great representative for Israel. I think that's someone that we should really look up to. Um, but to go back to the European Union, you've had all these states that have always been independent nation states. Yeah. They're kind of working on their own, their own systems, their own governance, their own sovereignty, their own autonomy. What they signed up for in the beginning was this idea of a of a collective Europe, of a Europe that could you know work together. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. But what they signed up for back then is very different to the situation they have now. Yeah. Um, now you know I like the idea of you know free trade and um, there there is some some benefit in in freedom of movement for European I citizens. Said a border system once the union are opened up. The border system. Yes. I mean, the outer borders are a problem. Yeah. Uh, the inner borders as well can be a problem. Um, but I feel that the single currency was it obviously is a problem because what Maggie said was correct. You cannot have a single currency for all these different economies because it, it can't work. And, uh, and Maggie kept the sterling silver, which was great. And, you know, you have countries like, you know, uh, Poland and, and Switzerland uh, that kept their currencies. Poland kept their currency? I know Switzerland did. Switzerland kept their franc. Yeah. Um, was it Hungary? Did Hungary keep their own currency as well? I can't remember. Hang on, I'll look it up. Look at that up, yeah. So there were a, a few of them that had kept their currencies. And correct me if I'm wrong with Poland. Um, but they have fared better, yeah. obviously, economically because of that. But I really do believe in the sovereignty and autonomy of nation states. I don't believe Brussels slash Germany, slash <laughs> Merkel, uh, should be dictating who can come in and who can't come in yeah. to a uh, country. The euro was adopted by almost everyone except for the United Kingdom, Denmark, and Sweden. Sweden. Among others. <laughs> Hang on, here we go. Nine countries. Yeah. Uh, Bulgaria, Croatia, Czech Republic, Denmark. Czech uh, Republic, yep. Yeah, Hungary, Hungary Poland, Hung- Romania, Sweden, and the UK. There you go. Yeah. Uh, EU members, but do not use the euro. They don't use the euro. No, smart moves. <laughs> smart moves. So uh, going back to sovereignty and autonomy, you have, you know, Europe or the European Union yep. that is dictating to these nation states who they can't, you know, what they should be allowing in terms of immigration. And I believe that's wrong. Yep. I believe a nation state should make those decisions for themselves. They should be able to say, this is what we want for our country, and we're not going to be dictated to by a centralized you know, European board. Yeah. Um, we had the case of you know, Hungary, uh, Poland, Czech Republic, and I believe Austria as well said no to Merkel's 
refugee intake from Syria, and they put up their walls. Yeah. They said, well, we don't believe multiculturalism is is good. We don't believe it suits us. Um, and these states, none of them, none of them are built on the structures of mass immigration and mass multiculturalism like Canada is. America, Australia. Australia, New yeah. Zealand, then the minority. So they don't have that base. They don't have the structures to support it, nor do they have the need and want. So what happens when you try to implement that template, which works to significant degrees in Canada and Australia, for example, but won't work in those countries because of what we've mentioned? It yeah. can't work. So you are going to have social in cohesion. You're going to have yeah, just cultural issues. Yeah. Cultural issues. You know, the 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 landscapes will erode. There's these are nation states that have always had one predominant ethnic ancestry. Yeah. So how can this template work? You're going to end up with parallel societies and severe cultural and social issues, which we're seeing occurring. That's what kills me sometimes, Europe. the ignorance of um, Western Western civilization, especially regarding like that anything that happens outside of our fucking borders. Yeah. I talk about a lot with uh, some of the Afghanis that I know. Yeah. You go to Afghanistan, man, you've got the Pashto and you've got... The Hazaris, you got a hunt, like you got about what three, four dominant ethnic groups in Afghanistan. Yeah. To anyone else, yeah, they're Afghanis. Yeah. They're yep, Muslim yep. Afghanis. Yeah. Then you, in between that, you've got the Sharias, you've got the Shiites, and then it keeps breaking down. Yeah. There's a, yeah, multi different forms different. of ethnic ethnicities. But isn't it? I mean, I'm not sure how exactly how it works in Afghanistan, but I'm pretty sure that they're monocultural in yeah. the sense that they've got a predominant monocultural. Despite that, mm. they still at each other's throats. Oh, they always will be. I mean, Th- and that's the funniest yeah. part. You know what I mean? To anyone else looking at, in, it's just yeah, yeah. the Afghanis. Who, who knows what they're doing? Yeah. But then you try and look at, like you said, you go to Australia, you go to you know, all these sovereign states that rejected the immigration policy. For what reason? That reason is exa- what exactly what you said. Because it's not going to work. And we've seen it not working in France. We've seen it not working in yeah. Germany, in Sweden, in Greece, in Italy. It doesn't work. And uh, I think there are a number of agendas at play. I think there's the, the Islamist agenda, number one. And I also think that there's the, you know, the, the corporate agenda. Because uh, you look at it two ways. Cheap labor. Yeah which benefits corporations, and you also have the... What also benefits uh, corporations is the increase in consumerism. The consumers that you don't have because they're in the East, you transport them to the West, all of a sudden you have more consumers. Yeah. You have more consumers for your goods and services, which means your profits go up, which means your sales go up. So I think it's in, in you know multinational corporate interests to flood Europe this way, and there's also the Islamist agenda to do so as well is because, you know, the religion is based on a, a, a brand of colonialism. Yeah. Which Muhammad started from, you know, from Medina onwards. So you have those two. You have the religious agenda for Europe, and you have, I think, the multinational agenda for Europe. So they're kind of working together, you know, side by side. And I had the, I had what I believe it was the ultimate plan for the Syrian <laughs> The problem. ultimate plan? Yes, the correct... It's not, it's not the final solution, it's the ultimate plan. No, I don't plan. believe in final <laughs> solutions, but I believe in, in... And this was the correct plan. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. I'm going to explain it, and it'll make sense to people. Now, you have, you know, Obama and Hillary going into Syria. Yeah. And they've, you know, de- they've helped to destabilize the reg- region for their own regional and, you know... Uh, regime interests. They wanted to, you know, build a pipeline through Syria to supply gas to Europe. Yeah. And who was helping them? Of course, you have Saudi, Qatar, UAE, their biggest allies in all this, much bigger than France or, or Britain or anything like that. Um, but Putin already had that deal with Assad. Yeah. Which is why he jumped in and railroaded Hillary and Obama's plan. So, you know, the U.S. has been, and not only the U.S., but those three Gulf Arab states have been pivotal in creating this um, mess in Syria. So you fuck it up, you fix it up. That's my policy. So uh, you rebuild the infrastructure, but you need to house people somewhere while you're doing this. So tell me, what is the benefit of sending the mass majority by the millions into Europe? To me, there's no benefit. You have got the Arab world. You have 14 independent Arab states. Yeah. Of course, we have Iraq. Forget Iraq. Forget Yemen. Obviously, we'll forget um, um, Syria. We'll take those three out of the equation. You have the other ones. We can even just start off with the Gulf Arab states, where the Arabs ancestrally come from the Gulf. You have Saudi, UAE, 
uh, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, Amman, six uber wealthy states. Yeah. Plenty of land. They're the same ethnic ancestry. They speak the same language. They have the same religion, even down to the fact that the majority are Sunni. Yeah. 90% of the Islamic world is Sunni, with the minority being Shiites. Bahrain is Shiite majority, but the rest are Sunni, Sunni majority. These are safe states where people can go. And that is the idea, isn't it? That, you know, when you seek asylum, when you seek refuge, you go to the first safe state. Yeah. And on top of it, this is the Arab world. Where is your care and interest in looking after your own people? This is my gripe, that the Arab, Arab world is responsible for looking after the Arab people in need, not Europe. It's not Europe's responsibility, it's the Arab world. So the mass majority of these refugees should have been absorbed into the Arab world. House them there temporarily. And the other good thing is that they're proximate. So no need for that horrible boat transportation that kills so many people. Yeah. It's a no-brainer to me. But the the Arab Islamist agenda isn't up for this. They'd rather filter them all into Europe. The multinational corporate agenda isn't interested in this. They'd rather filter them all into Europe for the reasons... I believe that I mentioned before, but this is the same story when you had the 1948 War of Independence with with Israel, and you had the five Arab states, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Saudi, attacked Israel, the new formation of Israel, and not to help their, you know, Arab um, brothers and sisters from British Mandate Palestine in need. No, it was to land grab, and it was to try to eradicate Jews from the Middle East. We know that Jordan took the West Bank, and we know that Egypt took Gaza. And Egypt ran Gaza with an iron fist, kept those poor people in abject poverty from, you know, 48 to 67. Um, West Bank was okay, because the Arabs that lived in the West of the Jordan were the Arabs that came from the East of the Jordan River in Transjordan. majority of them immigrated there. So they were back in Transjordan, and they were happy, more or less. You know, they were, the, they were back in Jordan. They were the majority in parliament. They were in government. They didn't have any need for a separate state. Now, we, we know prior to 48, there were two partition plans on the table once the British got a hold of that land. Because before that, when it was Ottoman mandate, the Arabs and Jews lived in relative peace. It was a yeah. peaceful time. The British got involved, and it, that created conflict. And you had the man that was the Grand Mufti of British Mandate Palestine who started a lot of the anti-Jewish at, at attacks yeah. on the Jews that were there that were a minority at the time. So he started attacking them. So then you had um, problems not only with Jews and Arabs fighting with each other, they were also fighting with the British. Now, there are two partition plans on the table, the partition plan of Mr. Churchill in 22 and the partition plan of the UN, 1947. Now, that was a pretty pretty fair and square offer. The Jews said yes to both, and the Arabs said no. I wish they said yes, but they didn't. Um, And then you had all this internal conflict happening, the civil unrest between Arabs, Jews, and the British, and then the Arab states decided to attack. So they created that big war. Who made the refugees of 48? They made them. So, again, and I bring this up because it's the same issue with the Syrian conflict. Instead of absorbing their own people in need, with the exception of Lebanon that did, that lived to Greta, but that's another issue. <laughs> the, it's true. The mass majority of them were left in refugee camps. To this day, generations of Arabs from that region living in refugee camps They could have solved that issue like that if they had absorbed all these people into their vast territories. West Bank was with Jordan. If they could have fixed the Gaza issue by Egypt and the rest of the Arab states absorbing the people that lived in Gaza, we wouldn't have this issue of Gaza and West Bank today if if they didn't do what they have done. They could have solved it. And the other problem is that uh, Jordan, Syria, and... um, Egypt uh, attacked Israel again in 1967. So they lost the West, Jordan lost the West Bank because of that, and then the West Bank became a problem. Yeah, it became became a problem. Exactly, but if they didn't attack, then they wouldn't have lost it. Uh, They also, you know, uh, Israel took Gaza from Egypt. This is what happens in times of war. People claim territory. They also took the Golan Heights from Syria, and they took the Sinai from Egypt, but eventually they gave back the Golan Heights, and they gave back... 
gave back to Sinai. So, again, we have another example of the Arab world not helping their own people in need. So we have this terrible situation now with, there's no solution. What can we do? There's no solution with for Gaza and West Bank. You know, Israel has no choice but to um, keep a good eye on them, on these territories, because these territories have vowed to destroy them, and to keep a very, very vigilant border security um, and to in- ensure their independence. I'll ask you something. I've never no. actually... I've never actually posed, uh, posed this question to you before, mm. but given what you've said, like we've been going for however long we've been going yeah. for, right? Clearly, whether you agree or disagree with your opinion yeah. and what you've presented, okay? I mean, we're just skimming over sure. shit here, right? Some things are facts, though, that I, I don't yeah, think yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no. Well, I'm saying your opinions are based on facts. Uh, yeah, facts and historical facts. And, exactly. And some right? reason, yeah. You've established the fact that you can do research. You have yeah. an interest in the world stage. You have an interest yeah. in... Psychology, politics, yeah, the arts, etc. Yeah. You're a humanist and an equalist. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah. How come you haven't looked at government? I, I'm, I'm, dude, I've been your mate for yeah. over a decade. That's yeah. why I'm asking. Why have I never actually asked you this? I don't know. Um, it's it, it, to go into politics. Um, you were just we're just saying now there are no characters. No. You're relatable. You're relatable. Divisive, but relatable. Yeah, yeah, but you're relatable. That's the yeah. biggest thing, man. You turn on the TV and these idiots in suits who have no idea what's going on out there. Yeah. There are no true salt of the earth people left on TV. You, you'd see the Clive Palmer no, or, yeah, or Pauline yeah. Hanson. That, yeah. that, literally, that, that's who dominates our TV when yeah. we, we talk politics. Well, then you have the Scott Morrisons and yeah. the Abbots and the and they make and no the sense. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. They yeah. make no sense whatsoever. They don't talk to me. No. Why have you not looked at politics? Uh, it, it, You've got the drive. It doesn't interest me. Why? Um, it because is not a career that I... I would... You know what? I would much rather be a diplomat. Okay. And work in foreign policy. That's something that would interest me uh, a hell of a lot more. Under what government? I don't want to be a politician. Under what government, though? Under what government? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't thought that far ahead. I don't want to work for the UN. Yeah. Because I... Actually, that is one thing I agree with that Donnie did. And we give credit where credit's due. When he walked out of the UN Human Rights Commission, oh, he said that yeah. we're pulling out because you're full of bias and hypocrisy. Yeah. Very, very true. And I think Hungary took a similar, similar stance. Because they jump all over Israel... They completely ignore Hamas. Yeah. They um, jump all over Russia, yet they completely ignore Saudi. They completely ignore Pakistan. Two of the most, um, you know, the, the, the largest violators of human rights, in my opinion, those two countries. They'd have to be in the top five, at least. Saudi and Pakistan. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, they're up there. Yeah, that's why I said stop giving Pakistan. I'd take away the the Western aid money we give Pakistan when they learn to stop throwing acid in the face of unveiled women. When they learn to stop gouging boys' eyes out with spoons because they've chosen the wrong bride, then maybe we can think about giving you yeah, that's insane some money. But that's actually insane. Yeah, that 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 should not be um, condoned in any way. And I think kind of the, this this aid money is a bit of a yeah. No, I'm not I'm not happy with that. Um, so, yeah, no, I wouldn't want to work for the UN. Uh, I don't, I haven't really thought that far, but the idea of working as an international diplomat, that does appeal. <laughs> that would appeal, working with foreign policy. I would, I think I would enjoy that. I would like to work with, uh, you know, the Israel Palestinian issue. I yeah. That's something, I don't think it's solvable, but I think that, you know, maybe we can work towards making the Maybe you should rebrand your, uh, your Twitter account on that, the unilateral diplomat <laughs> for the, the 21st century. <laughs> then I have to stop provoking people like um, Sassur and Clementine. Yeah, Ford. but the whole point, mm. like, without, pro- without provocation, like, if you don't provoke thought, then you but never the thing get is anywhere. I don't provoke them just for the sake of provocation. No. No, I mean, the, there are provocative statements that are made, but I feel that they need to be challenged. They're in positions where they can influence people. Correct. And I think that quite often they're not being challenged on certain things. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, maybe I've given them certain challenges that they weren't comfortable with, particularly Ford. I didn't last along with Madam Cockroach, but with <laughs> but with Ford I was giving her ideas and yeah. challenges I don't think other people were giving her. That's the point. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not against going after people, public figures. No, because that's the price you pay for being a public figure. Yeah. 
you see. So you don't have no reason to, to whine about that. And, you know, personal attacks can go too far. I agree with that. So, you know, you might have just cause for certain things that are said. But general criticism, critical thinking, I think that's what we're all about. Um, that should always be the case, and no one should be immune from that. Have you ever blocked anyone? On Twitter? Twitter or, or Facebook. I only... I, I blocked one person from Facebook. Yeah. Only because they became um, extremely insulting of other members. Yeah. And they had gone onto a, a friend's um, Facebook wall and taken pictures of him and his child and altered them, and that wasn't... I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. gone beyond just uh, yeah. debate. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I can't remember what the topic was about, but that's the only time I've ever blocked someone. Yeah. Yeah. Have you got any plan? I remember you were trying to get together, like you were talking to me about ages ago, about yeah. a TV, uh, not TV, like a TV thing or an online thing. Are you still working on that? I The idea is still there. Yeah. I'm just not so sure if I want to go down that path. What about podcasting? Podca- yeah, look, I think podcasting would be good. Yeah. Even like, I'm not opposed to a vlog, but I'm just not sure Yeah. whether I want to go down that path or not uh, it's i'm still still undecided yeah on that look man there's very few people that i actually speak to where i would li- mm. sit there and listen for really for, for two hours how long have we been talking I don't oh, know. you'll find out at the end really uh, there's very <laughs> few people that actually have their fingers on any pulse of political uh discourse or or anything in regards to everything you've said let's yeah. say for the last two hours yeah very few people can go into that kind of detail and back up opinion with fact with historical fact or yeah. evidence or even just reason yeah as i say exactly. you don't always have to provide fact not always no 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 sometimes it's not even available it's drawing parallels and and putting yeah. ideas together yes yes exactly so i always say you make a statement you back it up with reasons yeah at least that's all i want at least from people and that's something that i've had to help uh, others with on my platforms as well cultivate that yeah because quite often they'll say, yes, I agree, or no, I don't agree, or yes, Why? I like this, or I don't like this. Why? Yeah. And often they're not asked, not used to being asked why. Yeah. And that's what my platform has been about, is kind of, you know, fleshing, fleshing the ideas out. And I want to hear your reasons. And I, I enjoy that. I enjoy listening to other people's reasons. I enjoy engaging with people. I enjoy challenging them. And I want to be uh, challenged as well. Yeah. I find that very rewarding. You said... You weren't. A, you'd rather be a father than a husband. What's the Correct. appeal of having a kid? Well, to you, to me, to you. And I can only speak for myself. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Um, I find that when I made that other quote <laughs> all those years ago, very different place. Yeah. Also, at that time, was quite anti-relationship, which I changed that as well. I thought that was quite a, a very immature stance that I had. Yeah. Um, I feel the older I get the more I feel paternal urges. Yeah. And sometimes they used to be more fleeting. Now they're a little, they linger longer is what I'm saying. And um, I feel like I have something to pass on. And it's not about, oh, I, I want my bloodline to continue. It's not ego for me. I don't you mean care. legacy? No, I don't even think it's legacy. I just think it's love. I feel like I've got a lot of love to give. Yeah. And I want to give that to a child that I've created. Yeah. And it's an important job, and I think that I'm up for it. I think that I'd do a good job raising a child and being a father. And, yes, it does come with its headaches and its heartaches. And maybe, if I'm completely honest, one of the reasons why I sometimes I think I don't want to have a child is because I'm scared, and I'm scared about the love that I'll feel for that child because that love will be very intense, very strong, and that love also creates worry and concern. So as long as that child is alive, they'll be, in a way, a, a, a cross for me to bear. A, they can be burdens, the joys as well. Yeah. They can be headaches. You're always worrying about their safety. Yeah, but that's called accepting responsibility. Yeah. 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 Too many parents don't actually accept responsibility of children. Yeah, and, and again, you don't want to stress out too much, but I just am scared of that love because I, I know that it would be intense and it would be, it would overwhelm me, it would change my life, you see, and I'd make sacrifices. I think I'd be, outside of all the issues I have with, not even issues, Yeah, 
I can barely afford to feed myself. Right. So I would hate to think that I would wouldn't be able to support well, another yeah. life. Yeah. Or yeah. or I would be working my ass off just to feed this feed kid, them. let alone be around them to actually watch yeah. him develop. See, and grow I, up. I don't believe in working your ass off to that that literal point. Um, I believe that you you know you 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 work hard as such, but you don't bust your balls, you don't break your back. Yeah, but see, this, this is the thing. I've been coming to terms with it. Like, like it's I've about had, work-life balance. I've had, I know, but the problem is, is that not everyone is afforded that work-life balance. Yeah, doesn't matter how how ambitious you are. Doesn't yeah. ha- matter how clever you are. Doesn't ha- matter how much networking you do. I'm living proof of that, man. I've had so many job uh, rejections, and someone posed a question of maybe you're just overqualified. I said, if I'm overqualified for to doing base work. That's fucked up. I've had to, the few jobs that I've ever gotten, I've had to go back and scale my resume back down. Yeah. Because I couldn't be proud of, say, doing some sort of diploma or having some sort of experience. I had to make sure I wasn't intimidating my recruiter. Yeah. At the same time, some of the jobs I've been knocked back for, man, I look at them like, how? I've done all this. I'm not even overqualified. If anything, I'm probably just underqualified, but to get a blanket, no. Not everyone, I was, I mean, you've seen my tweets, like, as, as of late, like, you know, I, I share them with you every now and then. Yeah. And I, I nearly tweeted this the other day, but I didn't know how to word it properly. But it it struck struck me for some reason, when I just had this thought, and I thought about how universal it is. My thought itself was, I really wanted to go on, on holiday. This year? Generally. Yeah, oh, I did right. want this year. But I thought, I was thinking about going on a holiday, and realized I could... Never afford it. Right. That's it. Done. And that's a reality, man. It, it doesn't matter how much budgeting I do. doesn't matter how much I strip away my, my, my lifestyle. It doesn't matter about anything. I simply will not meet that budget. It's just not going to happen. Some, some of us are stuck on, you know, a decade worth of casual employment. Some mm. of us are stuck in positions, in roles we can't get out of or we can't move on from. It doesn't matter how much education we have. Someone said to me the other day, you know, why don't you um, you know, why don't you go back to school and do a trade? Or I'm like, do a trade. I'm 35. Yeah. Who the fuck is going to take on a 35 year old? Not 16 year anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And someone said, oh, why don't you just go do a short course? Do do a course. Do a diploma of this. Or do a diploma of that. Okay. Cool. They're fifteen thousand dollars, and you got to yeah. be a full time student for at least a year and a half. How the fuck am I going to do gonna that? You're going to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. You're going to supplement me my fifty grand that I'm going to need for the cost of living. Yeah. Cost of living. <laughs> yeah, I don't live at home. I don't live with my parents and watch you moving with your mum. What are you nuts? Thirty-five yeah. year old man's going to move in with his his senior uh, mother. That's what I'm saying. I don't. The one thing I don't. This is this is maybe where we, you and I differ. Yeah, go on. Whereas, like, it's not that I'm not optimistic and I don't see. Always look to sort of push on. Man, I've had this studio now for nearly three months. I don't know how long. I, yeah. can't, I can't afford it, but I've still got it. This was initially, this start, this podcast started three years ago, and it was just a backyard sort of thing. Yeah. And I've progressed it to the point where I actually have a studio. This is what this is my dream. This is what I wanted as a kid. I actually have a studio not attached to my fucking house, right? But, and that's the thing. People see me, people talk to me, people take my opinion in, people see what I do, and, you know, take me either as being half intelligent or you know ambitious or whatever but it doesn't pan out like that for everyone and i've lived in that sort of that world does that make sense i hear what you're saying you can have all the ambition in the world you can have all the credentials you can have all the smarts you can have the attitude right doesn't always work out doesn't work out no and even people that you might in perceive to be successful in that way that you're talking about they may not be as successful as you perceive them to be. Yeah, you know, either in in a sense of how they see themselves, or in terms of you know <laughs> the achievements you think they may have. They may not have that. You know, I, I know all kinds of people that don't feel successful. Yeah, they might seem to be the the vivid image yeah. of success. Yet they don't feel they've hit all these marks. But then you look at their life. You know, you've done this. You've done this. You should be yeah. proud of all these things. That's the thing. I'm starting to do that for myself, just yeah. as a, a means of actually taking something from everything I've done. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't feel successful because at 35, like most people my age, done well, a lot more. So okay. So at 35. What do you think you should have that you don't? Some form of a career, or at least a stable job. 
a stable form of income that I know, or a CV where I can actually lean back on. Should I be unemployed tomorrow? Yeah. I can lean back on and say confidently within a couple of weeks, I will have a job. If I put it out there, if I keep hustling, yeah. you know what I mean? I should be able to say, I've done a lot. Here it is on paper. I don't have to stress every single day about where my next meal is going to come from. Man, to, I was saying it to someone the other day. To this day, I'm 35. I've been working since I was 12. Yeah, probably 12. even. Yeah, I, I, I got my first job well before I was legally allowed to. Illegal, yeah. Dude, I've yep. never had a paid holiday in my life. I've never had a paid sick day in my life. So you've never had annual leave? Never. 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 And I'm 35, and I've worked every fucking day. How does that make... And I've helped employers make millions off my work. How does that work? And not because I didn't try. Not because my ambition wasn't there. Yeah. Just haven't haven't had it. You so know? it just hasn't worked out in that no. way. How insane is that? But it's, I mean, it's also a case of... You know, you talk about the length it can take to find a job. You have, you know, people in the corporate world, people that have had high-paying jobs when they're made redundant or when they quit or when they, you know, yeah. fired maybe in some cases. That journey to find the next job isn't always easy for them either necessarily. Oh, not now. Oh, certainly not now. Now it's even worse. Exactly. So you could have someone that is, that has the, you know, commerce degree, that has worked in corporate how many years and has been, yeah. you know, a, a project manager or a marketing manager or a state sales manager or whatever, and they seek the work. And if they're not being headhunted, if they don't have the, the networking, which does help, mind you, yeah. by the way, I know a case where it's taken people six months, even a year, even longer for them to find their next job. Yeah. So, see, this is the thing. Luck and time. I had, I had this conversation with a Fair Work officer, right, from Fair Work Commission, about a, a, a situation, right? This is a while back. And I remember him saying to me, you know, you don't sound happy. I said, no, I don't. Yeah, I'm not. Oh. He said, look, you know, I can sympathize. I have four adult kids and two of them are getting underpaid right now and one's been sacked, you know, unfairly, la, la, la. So I can definitely sympathize. And I said, that's fantastic, mate. I go, I don't have any kids. Me, in fact, I don't, can't even think about having kids because I don't even know where my next fucking paycheck's coming from. Yeah. I go, I'm running out of money fast. I go, and at my age, my parents had me already. <laughs> Most of my friends have kids. Yeah. I go, I'm nowhere near that, and no. not because I haven't worked. Yeah. And he went quiet. He didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to say. Well, this is the other thing. It's a practicality as well. If you're saying to me that, you know, there's that, you know, when your next paycheck is coming in, for example, yeah. you're running low, and there's no quick fix to that. It, immediately well yeah logically if if you're in that situation in that moment you can't think about having children yeah it's survival. you shouldn't think about having children yeah yeah so i i do the right seriously thing think about it yeah exactly and i don't you're doing the selfless thing yeah by not breeding exactly at, at this point in time but then you have the social pressures of why don't you have kids why aren't you married why don't you do this and it's like well, well yeah. fuck up, do you pay yeah, exactly. my rent yeah exactly well forget about the, the marriage is just nonsense yeah no, i don't the, the, that that's not important the the kids question is you know a little bit more significant i yeah. think but not everyone wants to have children you know what um we're we're all we're built to breed yeah. as such we're built to to copulate to procreate um, but there's a minority, and I say it is a, a small minority of people that don't have those urges or don't want. You know what? I don't like the idea that children... I don't like the idea that ambition is just a distraction in the way of, that you put in, in the place of children. Yeah. I don't like the idea that life, that's the ultimate, like, fucking, you know, um, like, that, that's all there is. Like, that is all there is. Man, some of the, some of the greatest minds of all time died virgins, you know, or childless. Yeah. yeah. You know, was it Isaac Newton? Died a virgin? Poor man. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. You don't, like, that is not the bile and end all. There are people breeding at a substantial rate. Well, look, even worms can procreate. Yeah. It's not, it's not, um, a milestone. That's the point. Yeah. It's know? not an achievement. It's not an achievement to be able to procreate. Yeah. The achievement is being a successful parent. Yeah. That is the achievement. That is one of my biggest yeah. fears as well. That's the achievement. Um, this is our biological, you know, imperative, if you want to call it that, is to breed. And, and, but you, can, you can't deny nature's power. You can defy it. Yeah. But you can't deny its power. <laughs> defy it. You can defy it. You can defy it and you can say, I, as, Back. As a, yeah, yeah, if you're a woman, if you're a woman, you can say, I'm not going to have children. Yeah. 
I'm defying my nature as a woman yeah. by doing that. But you can't deny its power, and there may be certain consequences for you never having children. There could be certain psychological consequences that do happen in some women that decide yeah. not to have children. These things do come up. And men might have certain regrets about it as well. I mean, the relationship between the child and the mother is far more primal. You know, the woman carries the child for nine months. She gives birth to it. She nurtures it in its yeah. infancy, where men more so take on fatherhood as a, as a social duty. They're not as primally connected yeah. to the child. And quite often men I speak to feel a little useless in the first few months because the child is so dependent on the mother yeah, and not eats, him. sleeps and shits, like literally. And needs the, 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 the nourishment of the breast milk. So they feel a little little out of, out of place. But the mass majority of them get over that pretty quickly after the first three or four months. They're in the full swing of fatherhood. They're feeling useful. Yeah. They're, they're in there and they're loving it. Um, but I have spoken to men who do feel that in the, in the first three Do you months. think... <laughs> I'm just thinking about yeah. it. I mean, you love your history, you love your philosophy, you love going back to 300 BC, even for, yeah, like you know yeah. your philosophers, you know that sort of thing. Anytime you look at history, you sort of the people that stand out are all the, yeah the, the big boys, the Socrates and the boys, uh, yeah, the yeah. gang, right? The gang, <laughs> these figureheads in history yeah. that influenced society, yeah. literally influenced movement, you know, social construct, influenced all that shit. Then you fast forward to, say, 2019. Who's doing all that? Reality stars? TV? Like, who are the people that are influencing the Instagrammers? Next- <laughs> 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 Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't understand. Like, you've got Instagram, like, influencers. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think about it, and then I think about the people I know that are happy just to whittle away in a job, come home, shit in a corner, play with their toys, and then go to sleep, have no interest in social norms, construct, politics, religion, philosophy. Why Why are we here? Yeah. You know what I mean? You and I have asked that question. I guarantee it. You and I have lay awake at night by ourselves in the dark thinking, why the fuck am I on this planet? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I have. And you, you, we've had that thought. Yeah, I have had that thought. Um, you know, why are we here? The, or the collective. Um, why am, yeah, why do we exist? Um, what's that all about? Yeah. Yeah. So I, what do you think? Have you come up with an answer? I don't know. Or not? I don't know because, you know, we're sitting here doing this fucking podcast yeah. and this wasn't an option 20 years ago. No. You know what I mean? My parents haven't had this conversation with anyone else. You, have, you know what I mean? Like this is something new. This is all something we're we're doing things now that are completely out of the box from considering where we've come from, and that's another thing. Like I think about as well is at what point is that that like our parents' generation and say the parent the generation before them that stranglehold. When I think now is the biggest shift we've ever seen socially, as in a big knee jerk reaction. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Slowly, slowly we were sort of gravitating towards something, and then all of a sudden, Donny politics influences all that has just has gone from zero to a million yeah and there's just knee-jerk reactions and everyone's losing their shit people are either trying to cling to something they didn't even really believe in but they ident- they didn't even identify it. they just recognized it and now they're struggling they don't know which way to go because it's just complete contrast and complete extremes everyone's going from fundamentalist to laissez-faire they got no yeah. fucking idea what they're doing yeah that's what I'm sort of worried about now. I actually don't know where, where we're going to go. You don't know where we're heading. 2020 is going to be a fucking frontier, and I don't think anyone knows where we're Are we going. headed for a cultural collapse? I, I think we're close. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Camille Paglia said something interesting about this. She said that decadence uh, is is symptomatic of the collapse or the 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 potential collapse of a society it's heading in that direction if you look at she says if you look through history you see that a, a decadence period of extravagance of yeah. sexual hedonism is the beginning of the end and she um compared this in our time now with transgender mania yeah she believes that transgender mania is a sign of our culture's impending collapse it is our culture's form of decadence yeah 
and, um, you know, hedonism, if you want to call it that, which I found interesting. And she, I can't remember off the top of my head now, but she gave all these other examples through history. Um, but I think another thing that we have to consider is, I don't know, something something that Hitch said, and I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to rob his quotes and pretend <laughs> they're, they're mine. I, you know, I would never steal from him. You know, but he said, you know, the barbarians never take a city until somebody opens the gates for them. Yeah. And that has stayed with me for a very long time. It's the enablers within a society, the enablers of the barbarians, let's say, whoever those barbarians are, they're the, they're the ones that help to self-erode their own society, yeah. to, you know, uh, to sabotage themselves in the process. So you have to hold those gates open and let the barbarians in. You have to facilitate the barbarians in order for them to take the city. So maybe we can look at it that way as well, is that if we're talking about cultural collapses, what we're saying is that we, you know, if we take that quote, is that we've allowed it to happen. Well, look at mass media. If it's not a reality show, it's something pushed yeah. by corporate work. Yeah, corporate exactly. Agenda. We've allowed it to happen. Yeah. We've opened the gates to whatever form of barbarism. There could be many <laughs> forms of barbarism. I love that word, but there are many yeah. forms of barbarism. We've enabled the barbarians. We've yeah. allowed them in, and we've allowed them to do whatever it is they want to do to the city, or you know, in other words, to the, to the society, to the culture. How long do you culture. reckon this is going to go on? As someone who's studied timelines throughout history. The, the cultural wars, the... Oh, dear. Um, it has to... It, I'm hoping, I'm going to be optimistic here, you know. And you heard it here first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, we've had the, the pendulum, you know, maybe once upon a time was, you know, so far to the right, and then it swings so far to the left. Yeah. Extremities. We're getting extremities. And, you know, I feel that hopefully we can come back to the middle. We can find middle ground. We can become more centric. Yeah. That's what I'm hoping for, instead of a cultural collapse. There's nothing wrong with being centric. Certainly not. You know? Yeah. They, no. Any time, especially in politics, if you hear about centrists, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, there's nothing wrong with it. No. It's the idea is you take the best of both worlds, and something that I keep. This is what worries me now. Uh, something I keep hearing all the time, in regards to Donny, in regards to uh, gay marriage, in regards to the EU. Yeah. Boris fucking Johnson. No. Oh, Boris, yeah. Ask, ask on a man. Forgot he's, about him. He's fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Bring back Maggie. He's just a <laughs> bubbling mess, man. Yeah. You, I keep hearing it. I want to be on the right side of history. Mm. I keep hearing that all the time. All the time, man. It's a, it's a yeah. fucking catchword for, for anything. Pseudoscience and politics now. I want to be on the right side of history. Mm. What is the right side of history now? Oosh. You know what I mean? I don't mean? know. I don't know. I, I don't think it's ever been as ambiguous as it is it now. It certainly seems ambiguous. It, you know maybe I mean? Poland, 1937. Yeah, I know what the right side of history was. The Berlin Wall. I know what the right side of history was. Stalinism. Yeah, yeah you, can, you can go on and on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But now, yeah. 2020, what is the right side of history? Maybe it's keeping a firm two feet in the middle. Yeah. Maybe that's what it is. Trying to remain as centric as possible, you know, and to believe in, you know, things that we've talked about before, fairness, you know, equality, yeah. justice, focusing on the core issues. You know, and I mentioned them before. These will always be important. I want to reiterate them. We focus on, you know, equal rights. We focus on fairness. We focus on employment. We focus on education. We focus on social services. Our environment is such an important thing. We focus oh. on infrastructure. We focus on economic economics. Climate we focus on change employment. deniers are out of their fucking minds. Well, it's scientifically it's, proven. It's science. It's, it's science. facts. Yeah, exactly. Oh. So these are the things that I try to remain focused on and that I hope will keep me centric. Now, I don't like terms right and left i don't use them I, I avoid using them because i think that they change so much over time and uh, you know back in the 60s you know i would have been a complete li um, leftist yeah uh and i i consider myself a classic leftist <laughs> 
a classic liberal yeah. of the 60s and 70s. You know, a lot of the, the ideas and um, the philosophies that they have, you know, I prescribe to. Um, and we talk about equality and, and you know, that, that brand of feminism that yeah. I discussed earlier and being anti-war and being a humanist and, uh, you know, freedoms, freedoms and, you know, abortion rights and sexual, you know, liberties. These are all things that I prescribe to. But in today's age, I don't identify with many of the things that you would call the left, you see. And, you know, there are people out there now that would define me as a conservative, and I don't think it's particularly problematic to be a conservative. It depends on what type of conservative you are. Yeah. I think there are some good conservative points. Some people might call me right-wing. Yeah. Some people call me conservative. Some people might say I'm a hybrid, that I swing. It just depends on whatever topic you're talking about. But... I think that there are some very contentious topics these days. It, it annoys me because if you take a, the stance that I take, you're thrown into the, the right wing yeah. or the far right. No matter what your argument is, the fact that you take a certain stance, you're thrown in there with, with bigots yeah. and extremists and idiots. And I'm going to mention these topics. I think you know we talk about modern feminism, a stance on modern feminism, a stance on Islam. Yeah as a religious ideology, a stance on the transgender, you know, gender issues, things like that, yeah. a stance on immigration and multiculturalism, mass immigration. And again, um, my policy on these things will change depending on the nation state we're talking about. But all these issues will throw you into... Yeah, if you take the stance that yeah, I yeah. take, you will be thrown into the, the right-wing, far-right-wing pit. Yeah. And I think that's very unfair because <clears throat> the arguments I never listen to. Like, I might have the same contention as a, as a, um, as a, a an ultra-nationalist from somewhere or yeah. a, a, what you would consider a, a far-right person, but our arguments may be very, very different and we come at it from a very, very different perspective. And I believe I come at it from, you know, a, a well-researched um, and, and arguments that have what I believe, reason yeah, and logic. Let me ask you so, a question. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Conflict is inevitable. Yes. Do you think world war is inevitable? Y yes. Yeah? Yes, I do. Um, are we look at our two big world wars. Yeah. You know, the first world war... It's a, it's a battle of empires. Yeah. The crumbling of all these empires, you know, the Austro-Hungarian, the was, wasn't that Germanic. One of the, wasn't that one of the, the, the biggest wars that where more uh, empires had uh, basically uh, dissolved after it? Yeah, exactly, because yeah. you had uh, the British Empire. Yeah, the and Ottomans were still around. Allies, yeah, versus all initially the Russian empires with them, but they changed yeah. teams. You had the Austro-Hungarian, you had the, the Germanic Empire, and you had the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. And they all, yeah. They they're all, gone. They're all gone. Yeah. Um, the Second World War, because yeah. we needed to stop Adolf yeah. and the spread of Nazi Germany. But in itself, I mean, that his whole ideology... That was bullshit. <laughs> well, of course, it was, you know, what he wanted to do was uh, in the, turn Europe into a German colony yeah. and to dominate, effectively dominate the world with his, with his ideology. Um, it needed to be fought, but the, the motivations behind it, or, you know, what led to World War II, were... Yeah. You know, we're ridiculous. What about going forward from here? You th well, do you think that world war can be avoided? Yes, because I think if Hitler didn't do what he did, then that would have been avoided. Yeah. All that, all, all of the consequences of him, you know, taking a leadership of Germany as dictator and implementing his plans, that could have been avoided. World War One. if empires didn't have to clash, it could have been avoided. You know, people will argue that we're in the third phase yeah. of World War. They've been saying that for years. They thought Iraq was going to be the World War. Yeah, with Syria in particular. I mean, again, that, that is a proxy war. Yeah. Even before that, even after 9-11, they thought that was the kickoff of the World yeah, War. Yeah, yeah. I think that there's this whole thing about the Third World War being the proxy war that you have the U.S. and its allies versus Russia, Syria, 
yeah. North Korea, uh, China, and Iran. Yeah. You know, so... Forget what's going on in the South Seas. <laughs> <Forget>. <laughs> like, we're overlooking all that right now. Yeah. But... Yeah, I think it's inevitable if people find ways of working around their issues. <laughs> I know that sounds need to re- simple. You need to relax, mate. <laughs> yeah, I know that <laughs> sounds is... very simple, and I know it's yeah. more complex than that. But you talk about, you know, how can we avoid yeah. world war is that we come to the table and we, we negotiate. The empires don't start fighting. They negotiate. Yeah. You know? But actually, the, the two wars that I do think were necessary was World War Two. It needed to be fought because we needed to stop what was happening. Yeah. Um, and also, I think the Falkland Islands, which was a small <laughs> war in comparison, obviously. I just think it crushed to the clown. <laughs> the Falklands have been invaded. <laughs> but think about it. If you have... It's your territory. Wherever it is in the world, it's British territory yeah. and for centuries. And the mass majority of people living on it are ethnic ancestral Brits, British citizens, uh, a fascist dictatorship, which was Argentina at the time, decides that it wants to take these islands and it's going to annex your land and your people. <laughs> yeah. But what are you going to do? Well, of course, Maggie went in there. Yeah. Well, it just makes complete sense. <laughs> and I also think that she was correct in sinking the Belgrano. Um, and even the, the captain, the Argentinian captain, the Belgrano, said the same thing. They ha- might have been moving away, as they claim, but they were still in restricted yeah. territory. So Maggie said sink it. And she <laughs> did. So, I, you know, you're in restricted territory. This is what happens. Man, how did we get so dark? It was meant to be uplifting. Was it? Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How long do you reckon we'll be running, man? Two hours. Are you joking? Is that your final answer? It feels like only two hours. Two hours and 50 minutes. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, we haven't stopped talking. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. How do you feel? Good. You, yourself? <laughs> yeah, I'm all right, man. I'm just thinking yeah. I've got this fucking hernia. I don't even know what you it gotta is. You've got to get to the get... doctor. Oh, yeah. no, man. I just think it's time off work, and I just can't afford it. Um, yeah, welcome to the... Uh, I still haven't come up with a name. Everyone keeps giving me their suggestions. Yeah, you we should had, come uh, up with a name. What do we have? I came up with the rat's nest. <laughs> someone else... <laughs> someone gave me the bunker. Someone yeah. gave me ground control, ground zero, uh, the situation room, you know, the... Yeah. I've had a lot of them. You got anything to throw to this one? Not off the top of my head, <laughs> but when I do... Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I, and I, and I saw that, and um, you got your Last Supper-esque... Yeah, that was from season one. That was my... Yeah, I, I like that one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, but thanks for coming on, man. Thank you for having <laughs> me. It's been great. Um, yeah, as we said, I really... It's weird, because I know I'm probably going to get a lot of mail regarding this. It's It's strange, because regardless of your opinion, like I said, it's educated... It's educated in the sense where you draw parallels, you draw reference. That's what people don't do. They can't draw a reference to something tangible and logical or actually in existence. It's all just feelings. In 2019, we talk about feelings over facts. And when you start to um, prioritize feelings over reality and reason and logic and fact, yeah. as a society, you're done for. Yeah. it's <laughs> Be- Because... I tell you what, you're done for. You're done for because facts, reality, <laughs> logic, and reason don't care about cunt's feelings. Yeah, they don't. No, they don't. <laughs> That's the- <laughs> quote me on that one. You're done for. You're done for. You are done for as a society when you start, you know, coddling, you know, playing the the petting zoo, coddling and pandering to people's whims and feelings and tantrums and <laughs> over. The reality and reason and logic. You are done for. I've got, to, I've got to bring you back, but I've got to drum up some people for you to argue with. <laughs> you please. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, like as always, like, share, follow, subscribe, blah, 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 um, iTunes and yada, yada, yada. I don't even know where we put this anymore, but um, I think that's it. Thanks, man, for coming in. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Hold up.